All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, so where I have to introduce all the people on this panel. So this is the committers panel where you can ask us anything, literally anything. Uh, we have to answer it. Uh, there are nine people coming up on stage. I'll introduce them very briefly so we have more time to ask them questions. Uh, if you don't know which one you want to ask, just send it to me and then I will delegate accordingly or take it myself. Uh, so first, from Sauce Labs, Bruno. Uh, Bruno has worked on Android, just kind of go ahead and up, on some Android stuff uh, in Appium, so he may be able to answer some Android questions. Uh, next, Christian Brahman, also from Sauce Labs, uh, WebDriver IO creator, uh, sort of Appium related. Um, awesome product. Uh, Dan Graham uh, works on the Espresso driver for Android and wrote Appium Desktop. Uh, Jason Huggins has succumbed to jet lag, and so he will not be here, but I did not leave an empty chair for him in case he wakes up. Uh, next we have Jonah. Uh, where's Jonah? Jonah. Oh. Jonah's. John. Yeah, all right, well, perhaps in his place for now. Justin, come on up. <laughs> come on up. Uh, this is Justin Eisen. Uh, his contributions to Abium are varied, uh, but you can have Jonah's chair until he shows up. Yeah. Uh, next, we have uh, Kazukai Matsuo, uh, who I believe has done the Appium Ruby bindings and the TBOS support and maybe the Swift bindings as well. All right, I got that right. Uh, next, we have Sai Krishna, uh, who has worked on the Java bindings. Uh, and Srini, uh, where's Srini? Uh, he's also worked on the Java bindings. And then last but not least, my partner in crime, the one and only Jonathan Lips, uh, who is the architect of Appium and the reason why people can contribute more easily than they were in the past. Uh, good, and then I'm Dan. I created something that be... Jonah's coming. All right, so Justin, don't get too comfortable. Okay. It's like Hollywood. We have seat fillers. Darn. It looks bad on TV if the seat's empty. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right, I don't need this anymore. Um, so, you're welcome to raise your hand and we'll pass you a microphone. Uh, while you're thinking of your questions, I guess I can start off with one question and I will let everyone answer this, but please, we do want to get to many questions, so, you know, a minute tops or less. Uh, tell me about the worst, nastiest piece of code you've ever contributed to Appium. So Appium is a product where, uh, in order to work around vendor insufficiencies and things, we have to do things sometimes that aren't precisely kosher, let's say, in order to accomplish tasks. Uh, so I guess I will start, and I will say that there was a piece of Apple script in the initial version of Appium that typed in your username and password if, uh, whenever a username or password prompt showed up which made Appium not great for security, uh, but did make it work uh, when you needed to authorize Xcode to access things. Um, this is a hard question, because I've written an awful lot of code <laughs> for Appium. I'm trying to remember what the worst was. You can go last. We can start with Yeah, let me, let me think about that Maybe for a while. Let's start on the other side, because Jonathan is going to need to catalog things in his head. Uh, I add the unlock be a pattern for Android emulators. I think I'm the only one understanding that code, and I think it's broken right now. Uh, no one else can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so mine is less code related, but image related. When I started working on Appium, to, to get an overview about the project, I created you know this diagram where I put all, like, all Appium packages and how they are connected with each other. And I ended up drawing a lot of lines that at the end didn't you know, help you to get an understanding. But it helped me to understand Appium. But it's still an Appium. And I think, yeah, you can find it there. Yeah, at the top of my head, I think the, the hackiest thing I can think of that we did is we wanted to support Touch ID in Appium on uh, iOS simulators. And to make that work, we actually had to resort to using Apple Script. So that was. Uh, that was really unpleasant, but uh, probably worth it. Two points for AppleScript already. <laughs> Are we just talking about the hackiest thing? Well, hackiest or nastiest piece of code. The nastiest piece of code. You've committed. Oh, that I've committed? That you personally committed. Mm. 
we can move to cause your opinion. Probably there was some earlier stuff like before, um, like before we did the rewrite to async await stuff, where probably just like I was like probably there was an error and I really didn't like the error code. So we'd be like way deep somewhere in the process and you didn't know, I didn't know all the, I just started, I didn't know all the callbacks it would take to put the right error, like to come out to the top. So just from the very bottom, I would just like throw an error but put the whole HTML result in the error code and then just like catch it at the top and return it. <laughs> worst code? Uh, worst code is, uh, yeah, especially touch ID in the uh, XCR test because the framework doesn't provide uh, such a API, so we, we must hack. And uh, the action also have many limitations. So we, we, maybe we must continue to hack, hack, hack for the OS framework. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with the Java bindings, after John has left the Java binding, when I got in, uh, I mean, I yeah, was the king for that, so probably a lot of interfaces. Uh, so Java binding is just interfaces, interfaces. And I was having a chat with John, and he's like, why the hell do we have so many interfaces? I know, yeah. It's not about John's fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's all Simon's fault. Okay, uh, backward compatibility with JSON wire protocol on the client side. Java bindings. I'm um, still struggling to think of what the worst thing was, but um, I would say that actually the original hack that made Appy impossible, um, which which was basically with Apple, um, they gave us this one command that lets you run essentially a shell command from within their automation framework. And what we did is um, it was slightly less hacky than the original thing, but basically we used Unix sockets to pass blobs of text from the Appium controller into this Apple test process by using netcat on the command line from this, um, <laughs> this little thing. And then we would eval it using JavaScript's eval function, which as, as everyone knows, you should never ever do in anything approaching production. But that was like, the very core piece of Appium and the only way that could make it work. So that was definitely the biggest hack. And thankfully, with XCY tests, we no longer have to rely on that. Isn't it also like between the messages were plain text, but it was a sock with like a stream. And in between the messages to mark like where one message ended and the next one started, wasn't there like just five lines of asterisks? Just like asterisk, asterisk, asterisk like slash, Oh, slash, slash, no, slash. that was. Um, that was because, yeah, because there needed to be, the messages needed to be a certain length in order to flush oh. out some like element of the Apple reading the process right, like so buffer. that it would actually return it. So right. we just had, it was like star times 1024 right. or something like right, that. Right, right, just bunch of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so if you actually looked at it, it would just be like blobs of stars with the message now and again. Yeah. All, all right. Um, Please raise your hand if you have a question, and there are rovers with microphones uh, roaming. Uh, as we're still waiting for our first question, uh, I can think of another terrible, oh, there we go. Thank God, I don't have to tell people what I did to the C-sharp bindings. Hi, um, I just want to say that uh, I usually do the same thing. I sit in the committers panel for the Selenium uh, project, and I see more diversity here, uh, which is something that I would like to highlight. So I just want to ask you, what have you done to, I mean, it's still only men, we have to improve that, but you have more diversity than us, uh, which we are mostly Caucasian guys in the Selenium project. So what have you done to, to, to achieve that so far? Have you actually thought of that or was just coincidence? Um, I, I don't think that we should really be congratulated. Um, I, well, maybe there's more diversity than Selenium, but I still wouldn't consider our committer uh, base that diverse in my um, opinion. So I don't know, I, I guess I wouldn't say that we've done anything good. I think we haven't done anything particularly intentional one way or the other, which is probably a bad thing. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to I'm, have, I make a take, different point. but <laughs> I might take this. Uh, I mean, I take the point you're making. Uh, I think 
the, I guess what we've, I feel like, and this is kind of, I can tell my C-sharp binding story now. Uh, so when the project first started, I was writing the C-sharp bindings. Uh, and there were fields in the, uh, in the classes that were private uh, that for Appium I needed to override. Uh, and they were private, so you can't do that uh, when you make a base class. So I needed to just mark them protected was all I needed to do in the Selenium code base. Uh, and then, of course, to write the C-sharp driver, I could do what I needed to do. Uh, and I opened, actually, I had one of my, my underlings open a pull request to Selenium, uh, send several emails, several tweets to people, and no one looked at it. So finally, we used reflection to insert values into those fields. Uh, and that was in the C-sharp bindings until, like, I, maybe a year or two ago, when Jim Evans found it uh, and saw the code and, like, sent me a very loud tweet about how wrong it was what we did. And then we sent him a link to the pull request showing that we tried to do it the right way. Uh, um, but I think one thing that we do is that we are, we're very responsive and collaborative and we have a very good process for reviewing things quickly and not letting pull requests stay stale and that sort of thing. And being more active does encourage more people to join. And I guess having more people eventually you'll get diversity out of just like large and large. Yeah, I mean, we, we put a lot of effort um, and it's something that we've talked about as maintainers when we've had the opportunity to really help people through the process of contributing, uh, no matter who they are, and to kind of, especially if it's their first time, to hold their hand and maybe jump in on their pull request and write code with them and not just say, well, it doesn't meet our standards and therefore we're gonna close your PR. Sometimes we actually get in there and write the, the code that will help it get over the goal line so that they can get that contribution and that is really motivating and inspiring and I think you know does help um, open the door for people that might be a little more intimidated. Um, so we're doing stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, in general, as an as a industry and, and as a project, it's not um, super diverse, but that's kind of uh, sadly par for the course for a lot of these types of things right now. And I guess I should say, if, if, if any of you have ideas about ways that we could uh, make the project more inviting and more open, um, I, I would love it for it to be more diverse than, than it is. I think we'd benefit from that, so please, let us know. I'm certainly open to talking about that. And uh, speaking of encouraging participation, like uh, please participate. You're uh, you're all invited. Um, you know the. I really think uh, our com community is like, especially on GitHub, is like as really as friendly as we can be. Like even on days when I'm having a really bad day, if I'm answering a GitHub issue or going on a pull request, I like really like I, I set aside like all of my own personal grumpiness. And I'm like, all right, like. Let's do this, like uh, you know, and we'll really we never close an issue like on Appium or close a pull request because we you know due to um, you know the like keeping out that sort of addition right like the only time we ever close a pull request is either it's merged or someone has opened like another one that does the same work better like or in a different way or you know to receive the same feature or the person most often has just gone kind of unresponsive. But we do a lot of like, come on, like, are you still here? Like, you can keep coming. So all of you are, are like very welcome. Like, please um, submit your first pull request, and uh, no one has any judgment on you. But um, you know, you don't you don't have to feel like um, it's really like, you know, when you put something online like that, like especially like on GitHub, sometimes you feel like the whole world is watching. But like, I'm sorry, like actually, you know, like, you know, Appium is not the biggest thing in the world. We all care about it a lot here. But um, for the most part, just, yeah, just try it out, put it out there, and we'll really help you, like, make sure that your code gets in there. And um, we're willing to explain it as many times as it takes to, you know, um, figure out how to get your contribution uh, into the system. Uh, next question, unless you have. Yeah, I just want to emphasize what Jonah has said. Um, from my experience throughout my career, um, everything where I am right now, uh, I thankfully got it through working on the WebDev project. Um, like, I approached um, our former head of engineering from Sauce Labs uh, like four, four years ago, um, and he got me this internship. And um, throughout some other things, like the Open Jazz Foundation, all the things, I was able to participate in standards and uh, a lot of um, other things that are not really work-related. Uh, so from there on, I would really recommend everyone to just take an hour or two um, every day aside or sometime the week to just contribute to open source and learn throughout this uh, process that can really help to boost um, the career overall. All right, uh, next hand, someone. If not, I'm gonna have to come up with a question to ask people. Ah, there's one, good. Hi, 
Uh, actually, I want to understand what kind of test cycle uh, you go through for any new MERS. Uh, yeah. So what kind of test cycle the Appium project goes through to make a, to a release of Appium? That sounds like a... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we use Travis CI and we use uh, Azure Pipelines to do our testing. So all of the different drivers for Appium, whenever they go through a pull request, they go through a fairly rigorous end-to-end uh, -end testing process and a unit testing process. Um, I would say the coverage could probably be better, but um, it's still a pretty rigorous process. And we go through code reviews, of course. And then, uh, yeah, during when we do a release, uh, we do a release candidate. And uh, we run some tests on that. We release that to like a limited group of people. They try it out. And once we've decided that Appium is uh, good to go, we uh, put a bow on it and uh, make it generally available. Uh, the the average length of testing for drivers varies quite a bit. Uh, some of them, it's it could be done in like five minutes, less than five minutes. Uh, some of them, it might take. Uh, I think the, the XUI test driver is our longest one. That one has about six different parallel tests, and they, on average, it takes about like forty minutes each. All right. So there's uh, Justin's got a question. Now that you've left the panel. <laughs> Can I come back up there? <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll have to take down one of us. Yeah, no, it's OK. Uh, no, I just want to ask, is, has there been any work or collaboration with the vendors like Google and iOS? Have they been more receptive? Um, well, Dan can not comment about Apple and uh, in terms of vendors, the, the two that have been collaborative, first of all, Microsoft with their Windows driver. Um, they're obviously not responsible for Android or iOS, but uh, they, they looked around at the kind of best-in-class automation stuff when they were looking at improving their own developer's experience and settled on Appium and WebDriver. So as far as I know, that is still working really well for the people that use it. Um, so that's kind of our first feather in our cap in terms of uh, vendors getting on board. And I hope to see that continue. And then obviously, more recently, with uh, Samsung's Tizen driver that they released. Uh, and again, I'm not sure how widespread that is and um, whether you all need Tizen automation support. But for those that do, um, it's you know officially maintained by Samsung folks, so they're a vendor. Um, but in terms of the big two, um, I guess I can say that I've had some conversations with folks at Google, and uh, you know Google is a big company with lots of people and lots of teams that are doing different things and overlapping things and have different opinions. But certainly there is an uh, openness and in some cases a desire to do web driver based stuff for mobile but no, no official uh, progress or effort that I'm aware of, sadly. Uh, hands, I don't see any, so I'll ask a question. Uh, sure, maybe for one for everyone so we can all talk again. Uh, tell me about uh, what you contributed to Appium that you're most proud of. Dan? Uh, Sorry. Uh, what I most contribute to Appium is adding all these new emulator features, like the when you can emulate all the hardware stuff, like battery, network, uh, phone call, fax, SMS. Uh, and yesterday in the talk, I had the live sensor that I could start running, creating a lot of PR for you guys next week. <laughs> That's it. I haven't worked long enough full time on Appium that I could think about something significant. Uh, but I would put on my HPV TV driver as like a showcase that you can automate everything with Appium if you want to. Uh, Appium Desktop is definitely my favorite contribution. Uh, I started that over two years ago. It was just, uh, we had worked on it internally. 
uh, Jonathan and I, and uh, it was exciting to see when it got released uh, how quickly it got picked up and how many use, people use it and how many people are interested in it. And uh, it seems to have helped a lot of people writing Appium tests. So. Uh, so um, I, I'm I'm glad you asked this because I remembered a super hacky thing I had to do, and uh, it's <laughs> is it what also, you're most proud of as well. It's also the one I most <laughs> no, it is, it is, it is because um, it was uh, I've always um, e when I was in in school I um, I was getting a computer science degree, and uh, one of the topics I liked the most was like compilers, and so I liked you know the you know analyzing languages and and building like compilers to you know, like take code and make it be other code. And so that was like was just one of my favorite topics. And then when I, I think it was like when I first started, it was one of the first projects in Appium that Jonathan gave me. And it was like the um, for Java, the the it was the Android client, the Android driver. And uh, one of the locator strategies is where you pass in a string of Java code, right? And then that it uses those locators in the native UI automation framework. And um, this is you know, crazy actually, because in JavaScript you can just take any string and do eval, and it runs it like it's code. That's not the case for Java. Java does not work that way. But you know, you can still say like driver dot find element by I forget what it's called exactly the uh, Android dash Android UI. Yeah, Android UA Automator, and then you pass in a bunch of Java code, and uh, so I I actually wrote like a, an actual Java parser that takes the code and you know like it splits it based on like the, you know, the dots or the new lines and the semicolons and then it makes sure all the parentheses match up. You can do nested like things in that. You can do like new finder I think and then it's inside that like next chain window or whatever and like scrollable, you know, UI and stuff. And then so it, it parses the whole thing uh, to find out what you're trying to do and then it uses reflection to like create those classes and then it calls those functions and then it changes the commands. And so I'm like pretty proud of that because it works. Um, I think it only broke like once, and uh, <laughs> but also it's super hacky. Like you should not do that. Also, it doesn't. It's not all of Java, obviously. Like you can't you can't do one plus two. It doesn't do math. It only likes the functions that are for finding elements. But I'm insanely proud of it. <laughs> uh, proud thing is maybe restart the. Uh, maintain the recurrent first, because I heavily used the recurrent, but that was became the call for maintainers, and, and the recurrent was the class-based one. It means everything is global drivers, so we can't do run the tests parallelly on the same Ruby script. We must split the process level, because everything is global. So I, that was very, a big obstacle was to run test in parallel. And that was a, on a big thing for me to be proud for the commitment. And uh, recently is the <laughs> TVOS or something for the XCU test. Yeah, Micro, actually he improved their many code and uh, I read the code, but very difficult, very complicated. So <laughs> I need more. I need to use the more my brain to understand that. But Michael also very struggle with how to hack and uh, how to make there some actions available in for iOS. So I understand the how heavy to achieve that. But that work also very proud for me. Uh, for me, the proud moment was uh, when we wanted to deprecate uh, the driver dot swipes and scroll to stops in the Java binding because uh, it was completely abstracted and it's acting really crazy. And that's when we wanted to just replicate that and bring in touch actions. Uh, yeah, that was a proud moment to bring in touch actions, and I still see people using touch actions now. Yeah. Just to add on to Sai, there was one moment in time he cleared out all these methods and uh, uh, these kind of methods internally used uh, touch actions again and it became super flaky. Yep. <laughs> so a couple of moments uh, that I am proud of is when Simon and Jonathan came up with uh, and other folks came up with WebDriver protocol, 
mm, Simon released the initial version of uh, initial support for WebDriver protocol in Selenium Java li libraries. Uh, I reported that to uh, Java client. Uh, for me, I think the thing I'm most proud of is actually the architecture of Appium that we um, kind of rewrote Appium several years after we'd started and we put a lot of, of thought into the architecture and I feel like that was sort of my biggest contribution because uh, we've been able to stick with that architecture and it's, it's served us well and um, we're not seeing much that we need to change. I think with, with Appium 2, we're going to add um, the ability to have some plugins or something like that, but by and large it will just still fit into the same architecture, so um, that was a lot of fun to, to, to do that. All right, for me, uh, well, contrary to the jokes we always make, like I have actually written some parts of Appium, like the uh, old applications and the old iOS implementation, everything with old in front of it. Uh, and the Mac driver, which hasn't been deprecated yet, but I'm, soon my Mac, I'm sure my Mac driver will be. Uh, but I think my product. Somebody asked for an update. What? Somebody asked for an update. I, I saw. Yeah. Like it, it took like five years for it to catch on, but like, uh, yeah, it's like Jason. I'm ahead of my time, right? Uh, no, I think my proudest contribution actually isn't any of the code I've written. No, it's more just like, and it's kind of cool. I could say, how, raise your hand if you know what Appium is, like, in this conference, uh, and everyone would probably raise their hand. But uh, I do a lot of traveling uh, around uh, my job. Like, I'm not allowed to commit open source at the moment for the last few years, uh, but I've done, I've taken on a lot more conferencing and advertising, and I've sort of made myself the unofficial mascot of Appium lately. And so I guess my, the contribution I'm most proud of is like raising the awareness uh, around. Uh, and then now when I go to conferences and I ask how do you use Appium, it's like maybe a third of the room or like half of the room. Uh, you know, whereas then I ask Selenium and it's always double that, uh, which there's still some work to do. Uh, but I know that when I started doing this two or three years ago, I, I could go to any dev conference uh, and it would be 10% of people. I could go to any test conference, it may be a third. I even heard of it. Uh, and now I go and it's more. And I guess I, I, the story I want to tell is I was in India last year for the Selenium conference. Uh, and this is in the interview if you guys read it. But uh, like I was walking from the uh, hotel to the venue, which was across the parking lot. Uh, and these two, this van pulled up like in front of me and these two women got out of it. Uh, and they, they asked to take a selfie with me and you know, whatever, we took a selfie. This is India. Apparently this is like a huge thing here. Like this doesn't happen anywhere else I go. Uh, or at least not more than once. Uh, and so then they, they went. And then I'm, I'm still walking to the venue. They've like gone in. Uh, and then the guy, the, the guy in the van rolls down the window. It's like this 40-year-old Indian man. And he's like, are you Appium, Dan? And I said, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, my daughter's got great jobs now because they learned Appium. I, I, you can come to my house and eat dinner. Do you want to come? And I said, I said oh, well, I'm kind of busy. <laughs> you know, I fly tomorrow. But uh, thank you for the invite. I sort of regret not going, actually, uh, meeting this guy. But it's sort of like. Uh, I, th I always think that like someone else would have created it. I actually can tell you his name if you want to know. I won't name him now, but there's a guy uh, who lives in Switzerland who, if I didn't create Appium, probably would have. Uh, but it's, it's good to see, regardless of like whatever, that like the work that all we've done like has had like an impact. And there are people here that, there are a lot of people employed like writing Appium tests full time, uh, which I think is work that, you know, with the existing frameworks before Appium would have been too challenging to write or wouldn't have gotten effective enough results to be justifiable from a cost perspective for the business hiring them. And so it's glad to see that because of the work that we've all done that like uh, a lot of good things are happening for people here. Uh, and so that kind of drove it home for me uh, when that, that strange man, who may, maybe his daughters are here again today. Maybe you guys know who this was. Uh, I, I don't, uh, but anyway, that, I will, I'll say that. Uh, any questions? Uh, there's one. <coughs> Last question. Better be a good one. My question is for all of you. Like, uh, if if you could change one thing in Appium, what would that be like? <laughs> we'll start from the end. If you could change one thing in Appium, what would you change? Maybe we'll start from the middle. Let's start with. Start all right, Srini will start. Maybe I would rewrite the entire Java client. Yeah. Probably the best thing to do now. Yeah. And I would pair with him <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Um, from WebDriver, I know that moving to Learner has provided me so much more um, speed and, and velocity in development. Uh, I think someone similar is planned for Appium, and I'm excited if we, you know, get there at some point. Um, 
Uh, I think XUA test, like it's really hard. The XUA test driver is really hard to maintain. Like you have to do a lot of hacky things to automate iOS, which is the most important platform, at least one of the two most important. So it would be good if we can find a workaround for that. Yeah, I think along with what Christian said, I, I think I would have uh, kept the new architecture of Appium without splitting everything into like 30, 40 different repos. Um, I think that's made uh, development a little more difficult, as those of you who are in the workshop with us can attest. Um, I think the architecture is good, but I think the way we chose to separate things out I was a little bit overkill. So that would probably have saved us a, a lot of time. We have Dan, Jonah, and Connor. I I think I would probably add types to Appium. Um, I think that would, you know, like I would still keep using JavaScript, but I would add typings to me, because I think that would catch a lot of uh, a lot of errors early on. Jonah, Kazu? All right, I can, I can go. I have a mic, yeah, I don't even, is Kazu ready to go? I can change is hopefully uh, make more peer public. I mean, when, when we, someone try to contribute a, Appium, then the guy maybe probably uh, have iOS and Android knowledge more to implement Appium. So my make the PL open means that hopefully the engineers who well know the Android and the iOS can easy to, I want to make easy to create a PL for the Appium. Yeah, deep understanding is necessary to make test more stable. I think, uh, can I say the, I wish Appium Desktop were better? Does that count as part of Appium? He's right yeah. next to you. No, it's, it's <laughs> what, no, it's great. <laughs> you should have seen what it was before. I can test it. No, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, what I'm saying is all of Appium is so great, but uh, Appium Desktop could like, you know, it could become more of like a gigantic tool, which is way yeah, more Yeah, like more of a, like a full-fledged uh, right, development. Exactly. Right. Like an yeah, I agree with that. Okay. I just, yeah, if I had more time, there's a lot well, I yeah, no, definitely no, no, no. would <laughs> do with Appium Desktop, for sure. <laughs> of course, of course. That's a whole thing. That's a whole thing, yeah. yeah. Man. All right, well, I guess I, I have to go last. So uh, for me, this I kind of go back to the beginning, and I would sort of rewrite history a bit in that, like, when we started this, I think there was this idea that this was part of the Selenium project, and it sort of formed its own project. And I kind of, I jokingly took a shot at like, like getting things reviewed by the Selenium project. Like, that's my one experience. Other people have wonderful experience with them, I'm sure. Uh, not my only experience, but it's like one of a few I've had. Uh, but anyway, I think it would be great if like we were in the web driver W3C spec with all of the mobile stuff from the get-go, because that was so much fucking work. Like for Simon, like, like it was years of his life. And it would have been nice to sort of leverage that so that we were also in that. And I think like we don't have a feud with the Selenium project or anything. Like Simon and I are friends. We you know we live near each other uh, in London. But uh, I think it would be it would have been great if like this was all kind of like unified a bit more. But that being said, I think it's worked out well uh, the other way as well. But one day we'll want a W3C certification. Uh, and yeah, I don't know if Jonathan didn't cut his beard between when we started and when we ended, he would look like he looked like last year. Maybe. <laughs> or longer. I, yeah, I didn't finish that in my head. Uh, anyway, I think we're done now, aren't we? Unless anyone else. Oh, can we, have, can we take one more? If it's a quick one. Quick one. Yeah, it's quick. Um, are we to expect a Appium Conf in 2020? And where is it? Uh, unlike, we copy much of the Selenium conference format, as you've noticed. Uh, the part where they announce the next conference at the end is a part that we are, uh, we don't have the infrastructure yet to, you know, to deliver that sort of thing that quickly. So uh, I hope that there's one in 2020. All signs point to yes. Uh, but that being said, there's a lot of, like Naresh can tell you, there's a lot of work between like the idea and then the event. Uh, and so uh, we have not started any of that work yet. You'll know soon. But yeah, I hope so, uh, and I believe there will be. <coughs> oh, no, I think we're done.
How do we keep the work-life balance with an open source project? I, I can, I'll take what once, if anyone else wants it as well. Uh, I guess like, I, you know, I once had a boss that was pretty lax and let me work on Appium on the clock. That was like six or seven years ago. And you'll notice my contributions have decreased since then, uh, as I've had other jobs where I was paid to manage people and do other things. Uh, and so I guess when it stops being fun, I, I clock out. Uh, and I think that's how I, I, I do it. Uh, and yeah, like I said, like, I have no children that are fed by Appium. I make no money off of it. So like, if I just walked away one day, it's in completely capable hands without me. Uh, and I think because of that, I'm able to just like turn it off when, when I'm not interested. But maybe that's a better question for someone who, who actually spends more time these days than I do. Uh, How do you do it? I mean, I, I do it full time for work, so I don't need to balance it off with work and life. I, I just do, I would contribute to Appium as a job, so. Yeah. Well, it, sometimes I just slip two hours of open source work into my regular work without telling anyone, and it's fine. No one caught me so far, so we'll see. <laughs> You're being recorded, you know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be live. We can way. peep my face, right? <laughs> We'll fix it in post. Uh, all right, I think we're actually done now. That was uh, Naresh. You yeah, I think so. I don't know. Did someone want to answer? We didn't get Jonathan to answer this. I feel like oh, yeah. he spends a lot of time working on Appium. He might be a good person. Yeah, I mean, it's really important to have a balanced life, as, uh, as Anton was saying yesterday. Um, you know, don't do too much of any one thing. Uh, open source uh, is fun, but um, it can also suck you in, in in weird ways and you can get like over emotionally invested in it. Um, so definitely it's important to keep a balance. Um, a lot of people don't have the luxury of their company supporting their open source work and you know, don't feel like you're obligated to do open source work on top of the work you're getting paid to do. Everybody's life circumstances are different and um, contributing to open source is not like um, something that you have to do in order to be a good person uh, or to be a person that's even useful to the Appium community. Um, as Appium users, if you use Appium at work, you can be super helpful by uh, finding bugs and just using it and, and coming to things like this. Um, but I do get a lot of, uh, I feel it, it's very rewarding to work on open source and I do work on it outside of um, my job and I try and contribute to other projects that aren't related to Appium when I find things that are wrong with them. Um, but I'm also, like Dan, in a position where I've been really fortunate between Sauce Labs and now my own company where my destiny is sort of uh, aligned with Appium. So it, it's, I've been able to use my, quote, work time to, to do work on Appium. And otherwise, I certainly wouldn't have been as prolific a contributor. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Can we have a big round of applause? Thank you for making Appium awesome and all of us.